So I want to talk to you, uh, uh, I put this a little simple to start with uh, in case uh, again we, we're starting with some newcomers to this uh, with no-till and then we'll get into some of the heavier weed management stuff. Um, so uh, what about weed populations? When we're in a, a tilled environment we're going to have a lot of that dealing with summer annuals, giant ragweed, common ragweed, lambs quarters, um, and these are weeds that emerge in the spring and and come flower throughout the middle of the growing season. Uh, giant foxtail, a lot of grass problems that we can have uh, as well. So those are some of the things that we end up with in a tilled environment. Uh, we do get some creeping perennials like uh, Canada thistle and quack grass uh, and a few others. Those are some of the things that we start with. So what do we end up going to um, when we transition into a no-till uh, situation? So we still deal with summer annuals, but we do tend to see a little bit of a shift in what species that we end up having. So uh, we can have some issues with cockleburr in tilled soils that when we go to no-till, the cockleburr is no longer buried under the soil uh, deep enough for it to come up on a regular basis. So we don't see cockleburr as much in a no-till environment. You would think that giant ragweed would be somewhat similar with the size of that seed and needing to be buried. Uh, but one of the things that we can, that depending upon where your earthworm population is, will depend on where giant ragweed is. So as you transition into a no-till environment, giant ragweed may kind of decline initially, but if you're not managing it properly as the earthworm population builds up, Earthworms love to grab a hold of giant ragweed seed and pull it into their burrows, which in fact then in, ends up incorporating that seed then, and you end up with having just as frequent as a problem with giant ragweed in no-till as you do in conventional tillage. So you may see a, a short decline, but then a pickup of giant ragweed in a, a long-term no-till environment, which again is is somewhat uh, different than what you would think. Uh, in a no-till environment, you're gonna have plenty of opportunity for lambs quarters uh, and pigweed species uh, to be prevalent out there. Um, creeping perennials uh, become a, a real big issue. Um, and when before Roundup Ready, this was a huge issue for us because we had few herbicides available uh, to help manage these things. Uh, but Canada thistle, quack grass are, are going to become more prevalent in a no-till environment than what they were in a tilled environment. Uh, but you're going to pick up some common milkweed, hemp dogbane, uh, wild garlic. Uh, there are a few others that uh, can be out there as well, but those are some of the problem ones that we have on a consistent basis. And since Roundup Ready, uh, the milkweed and the hemp dogbane have almost been eliminated uh, from the landscape. Uh, in our row crops. One of the biggest changes in weed populations as you switch from conventional tillage to no-till is winter annual weeds. And this was something we didn't really understand and appreciate in the early days of transitioning into no-till and we just ignored them because they, um, they germinate in August and then they survive the winter and they're growing in the next spring. And initially we thought, oh, well, these are kind of nice guys. They're going to die on their own. We don't need to worry about them. But before they die, they produce a lot of seed. And so we're talking about anything from mare's tail or horseweed, it's, which is the number one weed problem that we have in row crop production in the state of Ohio because it is resistant to glyphosate in most cases, as well as most likely resistant to ALS chemistry as well. Um, so that becomes a big issue for us. Uh, crest leaf ground sole is in, in the same family as what mare's tail is. Both of them have wind-blown seeds. So if you let them go to seed, uh, they're going to continue to blow around uh, to other areas. And when we get into delayed planting, the crest leaf ground sole can flower early enough and produce seeds that are blowing around uh, for the next year. And crest leaf ground sole has become more prevalent uh, around the state of Ohio and than what it used to be. 
Uh, common chickweed uh, is a really big prevalent problem in no-tillage crop production. Uh, it creates a dense mat uh, and is an attractant for cutworms uh, into our corn problems and that, that gives, gets us into some in insect issues. Uh, purple dead nettle and henbit. Uh, purple dead nettle is um, a host to the soybean cyst nematode and so we can increase our soybean cyst nematode populations by allowing uh, the purple dead nettle being present. So we need to be careful about that. And then we've got a whole host of mustard species, field pennycrest, shepherd's purse are some of the most common ones. And again, this is just the most common weeds that are winter annuals that we deal with. There's still another list that's twice this size that we can find out there, like small flower buttercup and um, whitlow grass. And then another, uh, an actual grass that gets to be a problem is annual bluegrass. It's a winter annual and can become a problem as well. So those are some of the weeds that we deal with uh, as winter annuals. Another group of weeds that come in as we transition to no-till as a possibility are biennial species. So species that take two years to complete their life cycle. So they'll emerge in one year of the growing crop and flower in the next year. Examples of those are wild carrot, poison hemlock, and common burdock. Uh, when I was a master's student up at Michigan State, I worked on controlling wild carrot. I always thought that it would become a little bit bigger weed problem than it, what, what it really has, and I think Roundup Ready was one of the things that kind of uh, kept it down to being a, a bigger problem. One of the other things that we end up with, uh, I talked about creeping perennials, and then we can classify another group of perennials called simple perennials. Uh, simple perennials are those that grow for more than two years, but they just have a root crown. So they're kind of similar to alfalfa. So we're talking about uh, dandelion uh, and curly dock uh, and then common pokeweed. These are all that have root systems that enlarge and allow it to regrow from one year to the next, uh, but it doesn't spread by that root system. Uh, it only spreads through seeds, uh, but that root system can enlarge and, and, and allow the plant to survive uh, for many years. Uh, and dandelion will uh, choke out a corn uh, and soybean crop very quickly if we get a dense patch of them uh, established in a field. So I, I'm just going to blow through this a, a little quickly uh, here, but I just thought for those of you that uh, are novices in the group, uh, what some of the weeds are. Again, this is the number one a weed problem in, in the state, especially in no-till, and this is mare's tail or horseweed. Uh, here's what a young seedling looks like. You can have a, a kind of a spatulate cotyledon and very hairy leaves to start with, um, and then you end up with potentially this size of rosette in the fall. And this plant down here at that size in the fall is the reason why we have such difficulty in controlling it the next spring if we don't do something with it in the fall. This is the kind of plants, once we get over three inches in the fall, I think those are the plants that are in the spring that are the most difficult to control uh, next spring. So we've got to be careful about letting plants get to be that large. This is what the plant looks like uh, later on. You can see it in the flowering stage. Uh, later in the growing season, a plant that has lots of hair on the stem and a lot of leaves packed into a small area, probably the most leaves stacked in a small area uh, of any plant that we deal with. Common chickweed, uh, you've got a plant that has opposite leaves, kind of egg-shaped leaves and a swollen node, uh, and then you can see the nice white flowers that you can have. Uh, and my assumption is, I haven't seen any, but I'm sure chickweed, especially in protected areas, have already started flowering uh, this spring. Well, it's not spring yet, but they've already flowered with uh, the warm weather that we've had. And that's why it gets to be a problem. That's why we need to manage these winter annuals in the fall, which I'll get to, uh, because we don't want them to be producing seed. 
Purple dead nettle, uh, a plant that has a square stem and opposite leaves. Uh, when we see it in the fields, a lot of times it has a purple top to it, uh, but you can have it in patches in other areas that are protected from the cold weather, uh, that it doesn't have that purple top to it uh, always. Uh, hen bit looks very similar in, in a cotyledon or in a young stage, uh, but as it gets to flowering, then the leaves no longer have petioles, so we call that sessile, uh, and so that's how we separate henbit uh, from purple dead nettle is the fact of whether it has petioles later on when it flowers. But square stem and opposite leaves as well. All right, crest leaf ground sole, uh, another aster species. Um, here's the smallest stage that I have. This is what we're going to see in the fall. Again, it's a winter annual. Um, and it pretty much stays a winter annual. It doesn't uh, germinate in the spring uh, like mare's tail can now germinate in the spring and early summer. Uh, chickweed can sometimes germinate in the spring as well, but the crest leaf ground soil is pretty much uh, germinating in the fall. Um, you have these nice uh, lobed leaves here, deeply cut lobed leaves uh, on a rosette, uh, and then it flowers uh, in the springtime. Um, somewhere starting about what, uh, about mid-May mid or so, something like that is whenever this thing starts to flower. You've got a hollow stem uh, and the stem tends to be uh, purple in color. Uh, field pennycress uh, is a mustard species. You have a round cotyledon, uh, opposite leaves in the first uh, life of the plant. Uh, there's no hair on this plant. Shepherd's purse has hair. Field pennycress uh, has no hair. You can see these uh, papery membranes uh, of capsules here uh, having the seeds. And it smells, it smells kind of garlicky. Uh, if you uh, step on a bunch of plants uh, or crush the leaves, it smells like garlic. Shepherd's purse has more deeply cut leaves uh, and hairs uh, on the leaves. So biennials and perennials, uh, here's dandelion, uh, a curse to no-till. Um, you can see that it has different shaped leaves, a lot of variability uh, in dandelion. Curly dock uh, is a simple perennial, so it starts out as a rosette and then produces a stem. Uh, anything in the smartweed family has this little papery structure called an ocrea. Uh, you can see curly dock has a very large ocrea. Uh, and uh, it'll come up from a seed and then uh, persist for several years. But you can recognize it because of the wavy leaf margin uh, on the leaves. Common pokeweed uh, starts out with uh, these uh, lancelet type cotyledons, uh, very large cotyledons. Uh, then you end up with these oval leaves. Uh, here's what it looks like coming up from the root stock in the spring. Uh, and then you end up having these nice uh, purple, uh, dark purple berries. Uh, again, not as prevalent of a weed as it once was, um, but it's still uh, out there that we deal with. Uh, wild carrot, uh, very thin cotyledons when it first comes up, a finely divided leaf, uh, and then it creates a rosette, lots of hair on this one uh, compared to some of the others. All right, so those are some of the key weeds that we can see and how to identify them. So uh, management. Uh, we have a very good weed extension specialist in Mark Laux uh, here at Ohio State. He puts out a weed control guide every year, and this is an extreme, extremely important source of information on how to manage weeds. There's a section in the back called Problem Weed Sections. Uh, that you need to learn how to manage some of these things. So something like wild carrot um, and then um, Canada thistle. There's recommendations special in those sections uh, on how to manage those weeds. He's got a special section in the back on how to manage uh, mare's tail uh, also. So uh, very important information uh, in here as to how to manage weeds. So just some uh, major weed tips here on managing weeds in no-till. Uh, we want to make sure that we control weeds prior to planting. It was interesting having this panel discussion and talking about planting into green. Uh, from a weed standpoint, we certainly don't recommend that. Um, 
And so there's a little bit of uh, conflict of some information there as to what goes on, but most of us as weed scientists believe that we need to have a clean start uh, before we plant. And, and that's going to make life simpler. If we do that, the weeds are going to be smaller. Uh, if we do it earlier uh, rather than later, and it's going to be more effective in managing those weeds. Um, if we have a lot of dense weeds, especially like chickweed, and we're going into no-tilling corn, you probably want to make sure that you get that chickweed killed off 10 to 14 days in advance of planting the corn. Anyone know why I'm re making that recommendation? The reason is the potential for cutworms. If you plant into that green chickweed and the cutworm is there and you kill the chickweed uh, in the process of the corn coming up, the cutworm is going to move from the chickweed to the corn. If we can kill the chickweed in advance by 14 days, we'll kill the cutworm because he'll run out of a food source. If we, plant, if we get rid of weeds in advance, we can utilize 2,4-D in the case of uh, corn and soybeans. 2,4-D uh, is a very important tool for us. This is more important in um, soybeans than in corn necessarily. Uh, but from a no-till standpoint, we need to utilize 2,4-D. If we're going to utilize 2,4-D at a pint or a half a pound uh, of 2,4-D, uh, you need to wait seven days before you can plant. Uh, we can go 15 days up to a pound with three particular products, E99, Salvo, and We Own 650. Uh, we can utilize that opportunity uh, for higher rates. Uh, if you using any other 2,4-D, you have to wait uh, 30 days at a pound. Uh, and then also, uh, if we manage our weeds earlier and we put soil residual herbicides out there, we have an opportunity for those herbicides to get to the soil where they need to be rather than coming in contact with the residue. But it still amazes me how we can put soil applied herbicides on a fair amount of residue or plant material that's out there and those pre-emergence herbicides still work. And then if we plant, if we put our herbicides on uh, in before planting, uh, there's less risk for herbicide injury usually uh, when we do that. All right, if we, we talked about cover crops in the first section there uh, and when to terminate them, and most weed scientists suggest that we terminate the cover crop ahead of planting uh, instead of afterwards, uh, and that's especially important in, for corn. You need to have that killed 10 to 14 days before the corn is planted. Uh, that's very critical. Uh, and if you're killing cut ryegrass, uh, you need to do it as soon as you can in the spring. So our ryegrass is going to be a little bit larger uh, at this rate and point in time with the warm weather that we've had. So we need to make sure that we get out there and get rid of it as soon as we can. If we're eliminating ryegrass, we need to go with very high rates of glyphosate because it's very difficult. And I would think at this point in time with the size of the ryegrass, we're probably going to have to be up to the 2.25 pounds. Uh, one and a half pounds is always the minimum rate that we want uh, in controlling ryegrass. We can go with a high rate of gramoxone, uh, like a, a, a three to four pint rate, uh, and atrazine at a very high rate of uh, two pounds, and do a pretty good job on ryegrass as well. If we're going after rye and wheat, glyphosate uh, at three quarters of a pound is usually enough. If we wanted to make sure we had a little better control, we could go to 1.125 pounds. Uh, for Austrian pea and crimson clover, we need a mix of glyphosate and 2,4-D, and the 2,4-D should be at least at a half a pound and maybe a pound. Red clover is a little more difficult to manage, uh, and we really need to have some dicamba. 2,4-D is not very good on it. And so... Um, it's not a good idea to be planting soybeans following red clover because you're going to have a very hard time to manage it. Uh, but obviously in front of corn we can utilize dicamba uh, in front of corn and manage that. You just got to make sure that the, you do get some growth of the, cover, the red clover. It controls it better if it actually gets a little bit of size to it rather than getting it when it's really small. 
The other important thing to remember is dicamba can injure corn very quickly if you leave that seed furrow open and the dicamba gets to the corn. So you have to make sure that you're getting the corn planted at the proper depth and that you're getting it covered completely or else the dicamba is going to injure corn. All right, one of the biggest weeds that we have to deal with is mare's tail uh, in no-till situations. And the best recommendation, since it's a winter annual, is to kill it in the fall. If you get started in the fall, life is much simpler and more effective. Uh, we need to apply anywhere from late October, and you can apply uh, until the soil is frozen. Uh, we've still seen some pretty good control with cold temperatures, although it doesn't work quite as well. But it's always better to do something in the fall than do nothing. What do we recommend? Glyphosate uh, at about 1.125 pounds and 2,4-D ester, maybe at three quarters of a pound instead of just using a half a pound or a pint of a four pound product. Uh, maybe bump it up a little bit more because of the possibility, the probability, not possibility, probability you have glyphosate resistant mare's tail out there. The glyphosate's obviously not going to work on it. You're going to need to utilize that 2,4-D. And uh, a half a pound or a pint of a four pound product is not always completely effective, although it's more effective in the fall than what it is uh, in the spring. Uh, we can utilize another program of Metribuzin at six to eight ounces, uh, plus a mixture of 2,4-D and dicamba. Uh, again, we probably need to make sure the 2,4-D is at about a, a three quarters of a pound, uh, and the dicamba at least at a half a pound. Uh, and maybe um, 0.67 pints per acre, not a half a pound, but a half to three quarters of a pint of dicamba. If you look at some of the premixes products, you got Weed Master and several others. They recommend two pints, uh, and two pints would be just a little over uh, a half a pound of 2,4-D uh, and um, uh, just a pint uh, or half a pint of dicamba is what you're getting. So. Uh, Generally, that weed master does work a little bit better if we get over a, a two-pint rate, uh, but it can work uh, all right at that level, too. Uh, for another option is 2,4-D at a pound, um, so a whole quart of a four-pound product plus canopy, basis, or metribuzin. Um, the thing there is is that if you have ALS-resistant uh, mare's tail, you're relying completely on the 2,4-D and that's why the rate needs to be up that high. Uh, but if you don't have ALS resistance, the canopy and the basis part of it uh, will help get those uh, mare's tail controlled. Uh, obviously, this type of program is weak on grasses, uh, and so you might want to add some glyphosate in there if you have some annual bluegrass out there. Even though you do something in the fall, you still need to have a spring down, a burn down in the spring. Uh, to, to manage mare's tail. Uh, and so before planting, uh, again, before planting, we can put glyphosate at about 1.125 pounds plus uh, 2,4 deester uh, at a half a pound. We don't need to go over a half a pound uh, in that uh, burn down if we did something in the fall. Uh, other programs include sharpen glyphosate or glufosinate, one of those two. And if you're using sharpen, you have to make sure that you're using a methylated seed oil. Uh, another program is 2,4-D glyphosate sharpen. Uh, 2,4-D gramoxone metribuzin works well. Um, and again, on th the smaller the plants, the better that will work. Uh, glufosinate is another option. Adding some 2,4-D or metribuzin with the glufosinate uh, makes it work a little more effectively. Uh, we do suggest adding some sulfentrazone or flomeoxazine uh, to those programs uh, to give you a little more residual control uh, on that mare's tail. Uh, you just have to be careful that if you're mixing sharpen with it, you have to wait at least 14 days on more, most soils, but there are some coarse textured soils that you have to wait 30 days uh, in making those mixtures. So it gets a little be problematic in doing that. Um, that's why uh, metri I mean, metribuzin is usually added with sharpen instead of one of these others. Uh, because the metribuzin can replace that and we don't have to worry about waiting for that 14 days. All right, if you did not do anything in the fall, we're recommending two passes of a burn down in the spring. And this gets to be very regimentic. 
uh, as to how you go about doing this to make sure you get the most effective control. So the programs include glyphosate plus 2,4-D plus Sonic, followed by Sonic plus Gramoxone, a glyphosate 2,4-D Metribuzin at 4 ounces, followed by Canopy at 4 ounces plus another amount of Metribuzin to add some more in, uh, plus Sharpen, or glyphosate 2,4-D Metribuzin, followed by Envive uh, and 2,4-D. You just have to make sure this goes on at seven days, the first uh, seven days before planting. The first two you can go on uh, at planting if you want. So get a little residual and burn down in, in, to start with and add some more residual uh, and burn down material at planting. Uh, dandelion is very similar to mare's tail. Uh, it's best to do it in the fall. Uh, you can have applications of 2,4-D at a pound plus uh, Canopy or Cloak uh, or Canopy EX, Basis or Autumn Super. Any of those products with 2,4-D uh, work rather well. Just got to again remember if you've got some annual grasses that you're trying to get that you're going to need some glyphosate uh, to go with that. Uh, you can go with the glyphosate at about 1.125 pounds and 2,4-D at least at three quarters of a pound and do a pretty good job, although it is a little more inconsistent uh, than the first one, although more consistent than going to the spring. In the spring, uh, you've got several products in corn, some Lumax or Lexar, uh, so you've got Balance and Callisto uh, with some Atrazine works very well for us, uh, along with some 2,4-D in that burn down. And then Clarimuron or Clarancelam uh, are very good on dandelion, although Clarimuron is probably a touch better. Uh, mixing that with 2,4-D and glyphosate. But again, you might not get as consistent control with that in the spring as you would uh, in the fall. Uh, other weeds, uh, biennials, you need to get them in the fall, a 2,4-D glyphosate combination. Uh, and summer annuals, uh, like giant ragweed, you're going to have to make sure that you have the appropriate program to get things burned down uh, to start with. Uh, and again, a glyphosate 2,4-D combination is probably the, one of the better things, but we do have to worry about giant ragweed and common ragweed that's resistant to glyphosate, and we're, we're relying on the 2,4-D uh, to get those weeds controlled. And then we need to add soil-applied herbicides uh, to get us through. Any questions? Yes, Curtis. I didn't mention trees. Um, trees can, that's in it. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I saw some fields last fall where I saw cottonwood trees that were about as tall as me. And so you certainly can have trees in no-till. Uh, the, the nice thing has been with Roundup Ready, we keep hitting the trees and we've been up in our rates and that's been helping a lot. Uh, but otherwise, there's not really anything you can do other than spot treating uh, the trees uh, if you get a handle on them ahead of time. But there are certain things like maples and cottonwoods that it's very difficult to get ahead of those uh, because of the number of seeds that they produce and they're windblown. So trees can be a problem as well.